we're here to visit the USS Lexington today and there she is in the walkway going up to her we're in Corpus Christi so the ocean looks great some waves rolling in but nice day today so they're in the process of restoring the Blue Angels exhibit here so we hope to have a good day there we go Well, we're on board the Lex, CV-16. That's an interesting kind of board. You see the airplanes up there? Here's the hangar. So, let's get aboard. God, it smells like a ship. <laughs> Boy, that's a familiar smell. They call that the bosun's chair, the captain's chair, but that's what they used to use to send people between ships at sea. That would have been fun. So we're going to go up here to the flight deck. So here we go up to the flight deck. You know, when I was young, I used to run up these steps. <laughs> and they're quite steep. You got it, Mom? You got another one to go up. <laughs> Just take it one at a time. Okay, we made it up to the flight deck. Now my day, my carrier, the Constellation, had an escalator. <laughs> it took you up and you didn't have to climb the steps. But it was mainly for the officers. Huh? It's supposed to be an elevator somewhere. Ah, well. That is a familiar sight. Because that's what we had on my carrier. The Tomcat. Yep. And there's the F-18. I think Hornet, yeah. These are lined up as if they were on the, the catapult. And back here would be the, the blast door that would come up behind the, the aircraft and then deflect the exhaust up 
these were, they were deflectors that would come up. They've removed the catapults, but you see the red line there in front of the nose gear. That's where the catapult would be. The shuttle would come back, which was nothing more like a... Oh, it's a big piece of metal with... A shoe in it, which the launch bar, the front of the launch bar up there would hook in to the shuttle. It would take up tension on it and then shoot it down that red line. Of course, the aircraft would be a full thrust, full throttle. And the ones with afterburners would have the afterburners on, so. Yeah, that's it. You see, the Tomcat would hook into, here's a shoe over here, you can see one, they've got it. The Tomcat had a different loss system. It had one going forward. It had another, the hook to the nose mount that went towards the back of the ship. But you can see kind of a shuttle there. And when the tom Tomcat took off, again, there were blast doors would come up behind it and deflect the exhaust up and over the men that were working on the flight deck. And at night, with the afterburners on, it would just light up the deck. They would go off with afterburners on. So, and there's the bow of the ship. I'll take you down there so you can see over the bow. Yeah, I'll put it on backwards. See, on my carrier here in the middle, there's a little raised platform about where that square is. You see up there, that white square with the red outline? There was a little bubble that stood up above the deck when that planes were launching. And that's where the shooter would be. But he was the one that actually pushed the buttons that basically shot the airplanes off. He was the shooter. And when they weren't flying, that little bubble would go down below the deck. But that was on my carrier. But anyway, I spent many, many days up on the flight deck of a carrier. You'd have all of the airplanes backed in, angled, with their tails hanging out over the water. And the deck would actually have what we call pad eyes, a round circular holes cut into the deck with chain mounts. So you could hook a chain into it and then the airplanes would be chained down. Most of them had seven tie down chains on them to hold them in place. During rough seas, rough weather, they might put 14 tie down chains on them. Well, they won't let you go to the front of the bow, but this would be the end of the catapult. Where you see that red line going over the edge of the deck up there. That's the end of the catapult. So you can see how far that is, right? Now look and see where the plane is. That's as much room as that plane has got to get airborne weighing somewhere around 15 to 20,000 pounds, more than that if it's got bombs and stuff on it. So, yeah, not much room. And they could shoot them off the flight deck here on the bow while they were catching them in the rear at the angle deck on the later carriers. So they could shoot them off and catch them at the same time, which is the resting gear. And, We'll head back towards that way to show you what that's all about. Of course, there's the island. On my carry, the island was much, much bigger. But and Mom actually was aboard my carrier. Yep. She came aboard. Well, we were at sea. At sea, we came into San Diego, 
North Island down there. She came aboard with a wife of a friend of mine. We took a tour on the ship, so mom knows what it's all about. Yep. <laughs> you can see originally the Lexington was a wooden deck ship. So you can see a portion of it here. And it takes a beating. So they basically asphalted over it. But you can see these are the tie downs that I was talking about. What we call pad eyes. But this is the old wooden deck. And the carriers were made like that because it was much easier to fix the deck in a hurry if they got a hole punched in it by a bomb or whatever. But then again, when they were burning, it took a while to put it out. But you can see just how big the island is. But we're going to walk back here to see some of the airplanes. And I see an A7E sitting there, or it's an A7, I don't know what model, but we'll see. T28 trainer is what the T stands for. See the other side of the airplane. Huh? Oh, okay, that's a that's like a B model. Did you see the guns in the front by the intake? The A7E had a Gatling gun on the side of it, a single one. But yeah, it's a B, A7B. The one I worked on that was the A7E. Hang on a minute. Many times I had a license to turn up the A7E for maintenance turns, low power. Many times I had to crawl down that in intake all the way to the engine. Check out the turbine blades and check out the engine seals to make sure everything was okay before I could start it up. I was always afraid that somebody was gonna hook up a huffer to this thing while I was down there. So I'd never let them hook the thing up or even turn it on until I got out of there. But you can see the air refueling probe. All the panels that are on this thing. Probably one time or another I had them all off. But see the sight for sore eyes really. That little door just below the star and to the left, it's kind of a, a, an angled door. Behind that is the auxiliary generator. You pull the handle on the cockpit and that door flopped open and the generator started. It was right behind that door. But many times, if you didn't have these wing chocks in to keep the wing upright like that the wing would start sagging and so down here in that wheel well compartment there was a pump on the handle and you sit there and you pump this stupid handle which pumped up the hydraulic pressure and brought the wing back up so you could put the wing lock in it <laughs> that wasn't easy to do <laughs> Well, I tell you, I've seen these things with every pylon full. And you, you just wonder to yourself how the thing was ever going to take off as heavy as it was. But, and they could even haul mines. And they could also install a nuclear weapon on board. But it's uh, quite a plane. During the Vietnam War, 
they loaded them up with so much ordnance and they became so heavy a lot of times they would get a warning light in the cockpit for turbine over temp in other words the engine was overheating so during the Vietnam War they put a switch in the cockpit to turn that warning light off <laughs> Underneath of it, you can't see it, but underneath of it is the resting hook. And that looks just like a big cow's hoof, is what it looks like. It catches the wire. But season, well, for her age, she's not in terrible shape. Yeah, they backed into something with it, moving it. But when you're changing the engine, the whole end of this airplane came off the piece that's here in the back and all you would have is just the end of the engine and the stabilizers many a time I've crawled up the back of these things changing parts worked on these things for four years all over the Pacific and let me tell you it's up here in the flight deck wind blowing and and I worked the night shift, so it was pitch black. You get a lot of times you use red flashlights and just felt your way. That was a long time ago. Here's an A6 over there. We also had them on board our carrier. And the F4 Phantom. Mom's over here looking over the side of the ship. See that Fresnel lens? That that is what the air pilots saw whenever they were coming in for a landing, and all the lights meant something, so they could tell if they were on glide slope, on power, for a good landing. I think one of the other panels were talking about that on the A7E trainer. They talked about it. Down there is the famous catwalks. So instead of walking on the flight deck, you could walk on these catwalks. And just to tell you, one night it was turning up one of our airplanes and the tail was over this catwalk. I had spotters out around the airplane to watch for people, but somebody came from the catwalk up underneath the airplane and the exhaust sucked him out of the catwalk and blew him over the side of the ship. So you always had to be careful when you were walking on the catwalk down there and coming up to the flight deck because you never knew what was going on up here. So many times you'd come up and just listen. Try to figure out what was going on before you come bebopping up on top of the flight deck because you never knew what was going on. But we'll walk on down to the to the fan tail of the ship. Okay, guys, this is one of the arresting wires. And this thing would stretch across the deck down there to that one on the other side. And that cable would lay on the deck just, oh, maybe six to 10 inches, something like that above the deck. The airplane would grab that as it's coming in and it would just rip this cable right out of that spool to stop it. Now we had four cables on board my carrier. I think the Lex maybe had three, but here's the other one. The idea was it was to catch the number three wire. And of course, if you missed, the airplane had to go full power. Well, we have, it was, as soon as it hit the deck, it would go full power anyway, but it had to get airborne again if it missed the wire. 
And here you can see a tail hook. Well, here on the Phantom, you can see it. It's a better illustration. That's that's the shoe, and this is the tail hook. Now, A7 had one just like it, but the cable would come into this shoe right here. And that's the only thing that would stop the airplane. It was coming in for landing. The only thing. And let me tell you, that sucker is heavy. When they would droop, sometimes we had to crawl underneath the airplane, use both feet, and push that hook back up and lock it into place, as you see up in there. A lot of times we would manually pump the hydraulics to get it up in the air. Then we'd take both feet, lay on our backs, and, and hook that thing into its lock. That was never easy. <laughs> Some trivia crap for you. <laughs> but being up here, I'm telling you, it brings a whole lot of memories back. A4, the Skyhawk, which is what I first trained on before I got to my squadron, then worked on the A7E. But if you remember, if you've ever seen that movie about the USS Forstall, when it caught on fire, the pilot of the A4 crawled out of the cockpit, walked down that fuel probe, jumped over the fire. Imagine, can you imagine, the flight deck is on fire, planes are blowing up, the pilot gets out of that cockpit, walks, walks down that probe, jumps over the fire to safety before his airplane blew up. That guy's name was John McCain. One brave son of a gun, if you ask me. This is the KA-3. This airplane here, we had one of them, if not two, on board my carrier. When, and this was back in 76, 75, 77. We were basically told to stay away from it. We just called it the CIA bird. Cram full of all kinds of electronic stuff. But you can see it's the biggest airplane. Really even bigger than the F-14 Tomcat for space that it takes up. When you get a bunch of airplanes on this flight deck, it gets crowded in a hurry. Let me tell you. But, yeah, the Lexington, she has four wires. You can see them. But there's another one there. Like I said, they'd stretch across the deck. Never mind. There's a Bofor gun. Here's another one here. And there's a little plaque down there if you can read it. It's what they used for fight off enemy aircraft. Beautiful day today out in the bay. Isn't it? A4's tails out over the edge of the deck. Many times they were like that, even farther back. The tail stuck out even farther. There's a lot of times I've crawled up on the back of these airplanes working on them with the tail hanging over the edge of the water. I guess I don't know. If we were young, brave, maybe stupid, I don't know. <laughs> the job had to get done. This is where the landing signal officer would be. He would be talking to the airplanes, watching them as they come in for a, la for a landing, as well as the pilot could see in his cockpit as well. There was three lights on the cockpit, 
telling you it was high, low, slow, was his angle of attack, all that kind of stuff. You could also see the Fresnel lens, Fresnel lens. But if the uh, landing signal officer thought he was coming in wrong, he could wave him off and make him go around. But we'll walk this way to uh, the fantail or the back of the ship for you non-Navy types. Those were in nets a lot of times. Some guys slept in those when we were in port, just trying to stay cool, but round over. I'm sure you've probably seen movies where an airplane came in and hit this and broke into two pieces. As it was coming in, it was too slow, too low. You see these white lines painted on the deck. That's where the airplane had to focus to catch one of the wires. See, here is the line right up the middle of the deck of the angle. His, ideally, his nose gear would be on that line. But anyway, the tour of the flight deck of the USS Lexington. Cobra gunship, the Apache? Nope, this is a Cobra. Well, I'm telling you what, that looks like a mean sucker, don't it? Yeah. Alexis is kind of Essex class carrier, I, th I believe. A little smaller than the Vietnam War type carriers. They were just a little bigger. Longer, I should say. The flight decks were a little longer. They carried more airplanes. But it is a floating island, let me tell you. Then sometimes when you're at sea, you got a little, a little crowded. 